All right, hey everybody. Welcome. Welcome, you've made it. We've made it. Um, today we're going to talk about man in the middle attacks on uh, doing it on an IPv4 network using IPv6. Um, and with that, we'll just kind of go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Scott Behrens. I work at NeoHapsis as a senior security consultant. I'm also an adjunct professor at DePaul University. I teach some software security courses there. All right. My name is Brent Benelgar. I also work as a security consultant at NeoHapsis. Um, and although he's not here, we have to give a, good, a big uh, tip of the hat to Nathaniel Cooper Knowles, a principal security consultant at NeoHapsis as well. Yeah, he kind of got us started on this whole project. So yeah. So what are we here to talk about? Well, um, we're kind of Gonna, we're going to touch on something that came out a few years ago, um, which is known as a Slack attack. And, and really, what this is is we have systems like Windows Vista and Windows 7 that listen to IPv6 by default. And uh, a buddy of ours, Alec Waters, developed a guide to kind of exploit this fact. Um, and it's known as a Slack attack. And we'll walk through a little bit how that attack works. Um, one of the observations that we made when we were playing around with this in the lab was that it's kind of difficult to follow the steps he had outlined. Um, we ran into a lot of issues. So what we did and what we're going to present to you today is how we've updated the attack to make it uh, a lot easier to use and uh, kind of a one-click install sort of approach. So, right. And so here we have our uh, plain vanilla legacy network. There's only IP version four on this network. There's a router has DHCP, DNS, and there's no IPv6 anywhere. We also have some hosts here, Windows 7, Windows Vista, 2008. Right. All right. And so what Alec Waters put together was a guide to create our evil uh, router here in the red. Um, although there's two nodes on here, the evil router and the evil DNS are intercepting uh, traffic. Um, they're doing, they're running an IP version 6 network, which is a node in the blue. Right. And then it's passing it through um, their packages and their DNS. Uh, again, this is their own host. Um, and then it's re it's uh, resending that out over the IP version 4 network. Right. And so what this really takes advantage of is, you know, all these operating systems that have the IPv6 enabled by default. We kind of send out this router advertisement and the clients say, oh, yes, I want to route over IPv6. That's what I prefer. And so we, you know, we really take advantage of that fact and we start routing all their traffic through our interface, for example. And then back out over IPv4. Right. Completely transfer it to the user. All right. So here's a little brief history of uh, the guide as uh, presented by Alec Waters. Uh, first off, you'll note that Windows XP is not affected because it doesn't have an IPv6 SAC. Well, Vista and Windows 7 work for sure. And when we were trying it in the lab, we uh, just got in our, cop our hands on a copy of Windows 8, and we found that we couldn't get it to work properly uh, the right. way that Alec Waters had written it. Yeah. So, so although see. it might be a little bit difficult to see in the next screenshot here. So the way um, that kind of looks like is that we have some IPv6 router advertisements, but the Windows 8 no longer accepts the DNS server setting uh, through Slack alone. Right. And so when we kind of run that at issue, then it, it tries to make a request, there, it does not get a DNS response, and then it falls back to IPv4, which is a technology known as uh, happy eyeballs, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Yeah. So there's some, there's some other issues with the guide that Waters had put together as well. First off is there's, there's a lot of configuration files you have to go through and, and edit. Um, so these, these steps were very detailed but there's still a lot of things to go through. A lot of IP addresses and ranges to go keep track of. Um, lots of configuration, configuration flags to get through. Right. And there's, uh, you know, it also used a lot of old and deprecated packages. So, um, you know, he, he basically said it was held together with string and sticky tape and that is pretty parallel to what we actually experienced when we were playing with this in the lab. Um, and, you know, because of that, you know, we, we kind of went back to the blog post and we were like, are we the only ones that are having problems getting this thing working? And we were reading through the forums and, you know, this guy Duncan couldn't get it to work. Um, Vox couldn't get a particular package to compile. So, you know, it was definitely a little bit too complicated um, for something that, you know, we were really thinking could be an awesome weapon for on penetration tests or things like that. All right. To make that so, feasible, we need. Yeah. yeah, so what we ultimately decided that we needed it was. Da -da -da, Click the button, man. The button. It, it, it's up. It's up. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah, check that out. I got that from freebanners.net. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> automation domination, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, really, what this does is it's it's kind of one bash script to rule them all. You know, after we spent all this time coming up with same defaults for the configurations, removing all the old deprecated packages, uh, you know, we came up with this 
basically one click install that takes care of all the dependencies, configures your host, and it, and we also made some adjustments to the way that it works so that it actually does work on Windows 8. Right. Um, and it's been currently tested on Ubuntu LTS and we've, you know, we've tested on a variety of the Kali flavors so, um, you should be able to just pull the script and, and run it to start manning the middling all the things. Right. And we'll show you how that looks like in a bit. Um, before you get started you're going to need to know the interface of your attacker host that you want to run it on. And you're also going to need a, an extra IPv4 uh, address on the network that you're attacking as well to do net translation. Right. And you're going to want to test in your own isolated lab first. Um, it is a, it is a relatively kind of aggressive attack. You're, you're basically going to route everything through your host. So if you imagine doing this on a relatively flat network where maybe you have 100, 200 or n number of hosts, you're going to be routing a lot of traffic through your, your host. So you need to be careful. Um, you know, we suggest just testing that on a couple, couple hosts first. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention that might have not been totally clear in the slides is that this attack only works on a, on a local network. You know, you need to be on the same subnet as uh, the victims that you're targeting. All right. Let's go ahead and see how the installation looks. Uh, and the reason we're showing you this is just because how little time you actually need to, how little time you actually need to get it running. Um, literally we invoke the command and within a couple minutes or less than a minute it's going to pull down a number of packages such as take it to do the net64 translation, the standard bind 9 server, standard uh, DHB v6 server and uh, that's a, pretty much everything you need to g start uh, setting up your IPv6 overlay network. Yeah, and I actually we'll make kind of a side note here when, when we were originally setting this up um, and before, uh, you know, RTFM done bind here, I ended up writing a DNS, um, DNS resolver in SCAPI to do some super hack job and, and then at the end of the day it was like one line of, of work in, in a bind, so just a lesson to everybody, please, you know, read your manuals. Um. <laughs> yeah. So it's ready. Right. And so, uh, although it went relatively quick, one of the other things that the script really does is it prompts you for two uh, points of input. Um, it asks you the interface that you're going to run the attack on. So here, uh, although it scrolled pretty fast, uh, the attacker specified each zero. And you also need to specify a free IP address on the network that you're targeting. Right. And at the end it starts up all of the relevant services, loads all the kernel modules that you need. Yeah, and it's, and then we should also mention it's a not, it's not persistent, so, you know, once you've actually set this up, you're gonna need to run the script again if you reboot your host or, you know, you switch networks or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's two line fixes to make it persistent. If um, anybody's interested, well, we can talk later. Yep. All right, so now we're gonna see what this looks like on the client side on our uh, Windows 8 host. All right, first off we, first off we see that the, it's received our uh, IPv6 addresses and it has our IPv6 uh, DNS server that's going to do uh, uh, translations for us. Right. Uh, let's pause on pause. Cool. Fire up our Wireshark and we'll load up Google and uh, another window. We'll see it's communicating over IPv6 on our uh, configured prefix. Right. And then we're going to pull up the flow to verify that it, that is our HTTP request. So we, yeah, we can see that the traffic, you know, un, un, you know, transparent to the, the victim, all the traffic is running over IPv6. All right, and here's how this looks like on the attacker side. So we have our attacker, he's run the one, one click install and he's on Kali, uh, waiting for that request to happen. So we see the request come in and uh, at this point now we're, you know, we're kind of seeing a combination of the IPv6 uh, traffic and we're also seeing us do, um, the translation back to IPv4 so we can actually get out of the network, right? Because we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that there, we don't have a full IPv6 tunnel out to the network right. or to the internet here. Right. So that was the uh, IPv6 request coming in from the client. And so now we can see that the victim's traffic, we have the headers there and some of the cookies and the data as well. And that's being retransmitted back out over, over IPv4. So basically within the span, a very quick, uh, you are man in the middling, um, your victim's traffic, uh, over clear text. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we really uh, think that, you know, the main focus here was just to improve the efficiency and, um, you know, it went from, Spending quite a bit of time in the lab to get it working to now it's just two variables you enter in about a minute of configuration time. 
Um, so. <laughs> all right. Unfortunately, not all is rosy in uh, IPv6 land. Yeah. We do have a couple of uh, issues uh, with the attack as it is. Yeah, and you know the hugest one is this disabling IPv6 by policy. Um, so if you know you're in an organization that has it turned off, this attack just simply isn't going to work. Um, and in general, you know one of the things that's kind of nice about this attack is that anytime you set up a new Windows host, it, is, it has this turned on anyway. So unless it's explicitly turned off, there's a good chance that you're going to have um, hosts that have IPv6 enabled. Um, one of the other things that we have to be on the lookout for are IPv6 network defenses. Um, and these are specified in RFC 6105. Um, there's also a guide that Cisco put out that talks about how to kind of protect against first hop sort of attacks. And uh, they have a technology called RA guard, router advertisement guard, that basically stops, um, you know, when we send out that router advertisement packet, um, that guard basically blocks that packet from hitting any of the other ports on the switch. Right. And some of the uh, other issues we've run into in the lab uh, when we're testing this is um, different operating systems will implement RFC 6555 differently, which specifies that there's heuristics for when the operating system will roll back to IPv4 if the IPv6 connectivity isn't coming back fast enough. It's kind of interesting too because it's not, it doesn't seem to be standard. I mean, the, the happy eyeball effect on Ubuntu is different than it is on OS X, it's different than it is on other flavors of Linux. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of room to figure out, you know, what those conditions are that actually trigger that fallback. And unfortunately, when the fallback happens, it seems to then just prefer IPv4. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're on a relatively latent network or your routing is latent for whatever reason and the hosts drop back to IPv4, there's a good chance that they're not going to actually route through your host again. So, um, once again, we kind of suggest if you are going to run this attack on a production network or something, you have some pretty, pretty speed, you know, have, a, have good network connectivity. Don't be doing this over a, you know, a latent wireless network or something like that. Yeah. Another issue we ran into is uh, different operating systems will prefer, will query their DNS servers in different orders. Uh, sometimes they'll query their IPv4 servers first. Um, so we miss out on being able to translate their uh, IPv6 uh, traffic to IPv4 right. through our DNS server. Yep. All right. So yeah, there is there is some room for improvement, and um, you know we think one of the biggest things is to actually specify the target scope because right now it, it, it snags the whole subnet, and that's a little noisy. I mean, if you're on a you're on a pen test and you're just targeting a specific server, you really don't want to route everything. Um, and, and so that's definitely something that we're going to try to work out here. Um, we also auto automate some basic network reconnaissance. Like it'd be nice if the script just picked the free IP address for you so you didn't have to specify that. That's just one less step that somebody could either mess up or just make it easier for everybody. All right. We'd also really like to figure out a way to detect if there's already IP version 6 countermeasures implemented on a network. For example, if um, being able to s send out a router advertisement and then just waiting a specified length of time and if nothing comes back, we can probably assume that there's nothing, uh, that, it's, that our stuff's being blocked. Yeah, that they have a, a protection enabled, correct? Right. We'd also like to be able to uh, automatically configure uh, a true IP version 6 tunneling to enable true end to end v6 connectivity. Um, and the reason for that is because sometimes um, clients will receive a quad A, a legitimate quad A um, IP version 6 address, and uh, they're not going to be able to actually connect back to that, that site. Um, and so they'll, happy eyeballs will kick in and they'll fall back. So we'd be, be, we'd like for that to be as easy as possible as well. Right, exactly. Right. Another thing we'd like to be able to automate and include is yeah, you, leveraging the uh, Hacker's Choice IPv6 tools. Uh, there's a number of very nice tools in there. In particular, there is a tool that will listen for the, um, for the router advertisement responses and it'll just, this basically just on standard out display the list of IPv6 uh, addresses that are getting handed out so you can see, and their MAC addresses so you can see exactly which clients are being um, uh, added onto the uh, overlay network. Right, yeah, so they'll give you a little bit more kind of metrics and, and give you a better clue on actually what's going on with the attack, so. Um, and, and we'd also like to see this expanded to more platforms. Uh, I mean, we did a little bit look at the mobile stuff, and it's just not IPv6 just didn't seem to be there, right? We were no. looking at it on Android, and so Android's just not all the way there yet. And then on iOS, the DNS servers are queried in linear order, so their IPv4 ser DNS servers are always going to go first. Yeah, and so and you know we ran into some issues with that. So I think there's a little bit more research that could be done to to figure out how can we get this across uh, a broader array of operating systems. 
Right. And uh, of course we'd also like to get this ported to other attacking hosts as well uh, to suit people's needs and preferences. Right. All right. So here's how you can help. Yeah, so go ahead and pull it off our uh, GitHub here. Um, just one other, you know, we, we love people to help so if you guys have ideas or have been working with similar stuff, you know, feel free to fork the project and, and make some changes and submit a pull request. We'll be happy to add, add whatever you guys come up with. Um, and then just one other note, just be careful running this on production networks. It is a pretty a kind of aggressive attack so, um, you know, test it out in your lab first before you totally, you know, blow it out of the water um, on, on somebody's network, right? So. Yep. All right. Well, that. well, thank you, guys. All right. Thanks.